And I'd like to begin um, with a poem by the brilliant poet, Laura Boss, whom we recently lost. She was an incomparable friend. She did more than anyone I can think of to encourage and bring forward young writers. She was amazing. And this is a poem that's wonderful and that I love called, My Refrigerator Talks to Me. Look at me. You've put all these family photos up covering my black steel door. You're on a diet. Your usual start Monday morning, off Tuesday morning. So I'm feeling empty and alone with only ice cubes in the freezer section and one solitary pint of cookie dough ice cream, which I know you will devour after the 11 o'clock news on Tuesday night. Inside me, you have only a diet Pepsi and some cream cheese. I am lonely. I miss your opening and closing my door every couple of hours when you're home to grab some leftover pasta or orange juice or cream cheese for your bagel. You pass me by and don't see the real me. Sometimes you smile at the family photos that cover the real me. Look at me, put your hands on my door handle, open me up. Fill me with cantaloupes, avocados, half and half, meatloaf, and peach pie. Visit me often. Put your hands inside me again. Laura Boss. And I'm going to read um, my first, I'm reading from Wonderama. And this first poem goes out to Judith, who said wonderful kind things about it. Tumbled. What in hell are you doing at night on the creepiest street in South Patterson, fussing with some battery busted wreck of a pink Barbie Jeep you found in the weeds and think you can get to run? Oh yeah, you live there, but still underneath a street lamp, alone, the summer each phrase you hear gets tossed in your head till the sounds reverse. So candy bar morphs into bandy car and starts at four, emerges farts at store and you consumed ignore the spank of steps and don't look up. Though you feel the shadows arcing fingers touch you and sooner than you can summon, done, done, ranger, the real hands behind the darkness pluck you up, and round your neck a thick arm wraps itself. You hear, I have a knife, don't make no noise, but knife and noise both start with the same sound, though he kite mill me works. And this is a blade, all right, its point where your shirt and shorts are parting ways. But he is due at this, fumbles to knead your front with his knifeless hand, and you drop your dead weight to the gravel, then fake him out, and escape with a few minor cuts and an ear full of slobber, and he doesn't get what you know he really wants. So you run a victory lap through the crabapple trees, past pricker bushes, beer cans, some bum's wet mattress. Screaming. Shirtless, triumphant, a geyser whirl. And this is called Grandma. Mischief made her lift her arms and turn with such a look of wonder on her face that I was not afraid to see the flames licking along both sleeves of her flannel robe but stepped back as one does from an act of God, the better to take in her glittering pale green eyes, her pirate's nose, the few yellow teeth in her little open mouth. As my mother, her own mouth open in a scream, rushed up behind her to yank off the blazing robe and dance on its burning. And grandma, naked, jubilant, winked at me while the kettle shrieked its way to boiling dry. 
and sent me from some far hilltop in her far world, a vision of what it was certain I'd become, wild-eyed and crazy and blazing like a six gun, nothing at all to be met with shame or fear. So this is for her who now has long been Ash, a chronicle, the last word of which is, oh, Okay, I'm taking, taking a sip of my tea. And this is called catching. Um, and it has to do with, you know, childhood diseases and how you got them. And sometimes your parents needed you done with your mumps before like, you know, your birthday. And they would put you in with other mumpy children. So this is about that practice. It's called catching. And it begins with an epigraph from Katie Dangerfield in the Global News. Despite health experts saying the vaccine is highly effective and safe, some parents are still choosing instead to expose their children to chicken pox the old fashioned way with an infection party. A pariah when she is well, but in sickness desired, a girl of eight douses herself with evening in Paris, dumps Cheez-Its out on a tin tray blissful with bluebirds and quivers with worth and scratches and tries to not scratch. Blooming with blisters, she breaks out the Scrabble Junior. The other children arrive at six o'clock to damply handle the tiles and turn the cards. They sip from the one glass of apple juice provided, tell her her looks are improved by the clusters of sores, tally the minutes until their parents return. Addled with fever, she registers only joy. Within two weeks, two thirds of third graders are absent she counts the empty desks with nascent pride. Mouths dry as hymnals, tongues too sore for speech. They writhe in fever, who soon will return to taunt her. Each familiar face, souvenired with scars. And um, this next one is called Nomen. It's, it's a new word for me, I love it. And it means that thing on it, as you know, that on a sundial that sticks up and whose, whose um, shadow tells you what time it is. Nomen, softly lit in a murk of amniotic dust, the only two faces in the hallway of St. Ag School, a clock with its echoing voice and shifty hands and a girl in a cloud of perplexity and distinction, the only third grader who cannot learn to tell time. Told to return only when she can name the hour, she watches the red hand hiccup around the track and the longer black one skip forward click by click and the shorter black one, like her, not do much at all. Teachers lean from their doorways to witness her fecklessness, then turn like the painted figures in cuckoo clocks to vanish into the movements of their classrooms. She's as likely to grasp the time as to knit a sock. Standing and dozing, she jumps at the bell for prayers, those words she knows by rote, if not by heart that are spoken each day at this time, just as God likes to hear them, with thou and thee and sorry we sinned again. She's been praying already for hours for understanding, which like the pony she begged for all last year, she realizes she never will possess. But still, since it's time to address the all-knowing father whose workings like the clocks are a mystery, the girl casts her small shadow and weeps for a miracle and covers her glowing face with obedient hands. Okay. Um, this is called larval and it's for people who once had fascinations with larva and such things and loved them a lot. Larval. 
They rest in silken nests in the crotches of trees until someone like you shows up with a big glass jar and harvests them, warm handfuls of gentle pets, and screws on the lid, which is punched full of jagged holes, and takes them home and into bed with you. Inside, each harbors a squirt of streaky goo, the colors of every condiment at a cookout. Squirrels, bats, foxes, and skunks are their natural enemies, as are children armed with big glass jars. When you are asleep, to reciprocate your love, they squeeze through the punctured portals in the lid, leaving luscious tufts of their soft brown coats and crawl to your lips where they spend the night kissing you. On your face in the morning, undulant eyebrows, tiny droppings like scattered punctuation. Like you, not one will find itself with wings, though one potential moth, too weak to travel, remains in the jar on a twist of wilted grass and stares up at the stars you made for her. Okay. This is called New Girl in Town. And I have a, a number of these for, for Franny, who was a little girl who came uh, rather unprepared for Catholic school when she was about 10. And um, anyway, I was, you know, telling her all about this section of Patterson, what's going on. So this is called New Girl in Town. Cross the street, Franny, if ever you spy Joe Moe, whose hand-hewn tar paper shack we approach on bets or pitch chunks of pudding stone at from moving cars. You'll want, too, to skirt Donna's uncles, drunk and jolly, who'll sneak through your screen door with snow cones and try to kiss you. And Ronnie V, who just got out of Rahway, we're not supposed to know what got him there. And St. Ag School is an iron maiden of dangers, though statues of saints peer out of each dusky corner. And Jesus, his plaster self, tops the entrance scare, stairs, where one day he stared at a second grader's vomit, handheld before his exposed and flaming heart as if to express distaste for incarnation. Expect more shame to be handed out than blessings, administered lavishly both in word and deed. For girls, 18 inches of steel on open palms. For boys, once slung across a nun's black lap, lusty wax on the seats of their regulation pants. So that's about it, Fran except for that candy store where the old guy gives out wax lips for Halloween and ends of cold cuts to the dogs he lets inside. He'll say, sweetheart, you look pale. Are you on the rag? If you're hungry, Franny, tell him yes. He'll put his hand on your stomach and then on your forehead, then tell you you're clammy, then toast you a piece of toast. This is called Condemned. And it's in three parts. One, Franny and I leave school with Debbie Nank, who's heard about Franny's house and wants to see it and maybe step inside if she has the nerve. But because it's Friday and Friday means Kraft macaroni, Franny runs the steep last block alone. Debbie freezes when we reach Franny's slumping porch, the house with its caving roof and glassless windows. She confides in me that if that's where she had to live, she'd race to the footbridge and hurl herself into the falls. Then she asks me where I live, which is downstairs from Franny. Two. Before waddling off to snooze in the dark all day, our mother's possum peeks out from his hole in the wall, 
one seated each evening with berries and cold spaghetti and night crawlers pried from the ground with a carving fork. In volume O of a neighbor's funk and wagnalls, in dawn's primal light with coffee and some despair, she learns that the only marsupial in our country, not to mention the first one ever to live in her kitchen, belongs to the least evolved of all the species. Like her, for millions of years, he hasn't changed. But for now, she takes solace in her possum's opposable thumbs, the phalanx of fangs he bears in a pink-tongued yawn. Soon her children will waken and plague her with their needs. Three, while Peggy draws John Lennon on the wall, I print in magic marker on the ceiling, a poem I love about poppies and the dead. Mary cracks black walnuts with a rock and feeds the pieces to our sister Judy, who pries the rusted lid from a can of house paint so she and Tommy can camouflage their beds. In the kitchen, our happy mother plays Nelson Eddy so loud that it drowns out the screams of the couple upstairs. She is the reason, she tells us, why we are so smart and smarts you can't buy, or we'd sell ours and get a TV. This is Hitter. We pick the gravel out of the fallen pears and eat them with Wonder Bread and squirts of ketchup, which, Franny, you learn to do because of me, just like you learn to embroider and draw a horse. And what do I learn from you? To avoid your father, to not expect a hot dog when he cooks out. And no offense, but I can't eat your mom's macaroni. It's served in the dishpan she uses to shave her legs. And when one day I share with you just what I think of your brother, who you yourself say is as smart as a carnival goldfish, you tell me my mother is old and my nose is big then punch me in my big nose and turn and run. So I grab my baseball bat and chase you home. Kick open your front door the second you slam it and there sits your father composing a mayonnaise sandwich and not too happy to find me dropping in. He hollers, hey, where are you going with that damn bat? And real fast I answer, oh, Franny asked for it, which if you're honest, you have to admit is funny. Then I whack you in your pink curlers and run like hell. Okay. And I'm gonna finish with these two. Um, Working Girls is the name of this next one. And it is dedicated to Althea, Gladys, and Four-Way Annie. Working Girls. Like them, she excels at her game and is fairly fearless. Like them, she endures the tedious for cash. So at 7 p.m., when most sitters head for the suburbs, she appears with a sleeve of Fig Newtons and Charlotte's Web at the sprung and screenless door of town's busiest hookers, who glance at her once, then pounce into their night. How to describe the extent of the house's squalor. Sink tectonic and dicey with towering dishes. Corners piled with bottles, clothes, and shoes. And a smell, egg rotten, easily traced to its source. A girl, the victim of a recent tonette home perm, whose blistered scalp is martial with rows of curlers. And babies, too one clobbering the other, who rocks on his hands and knees in a pizza box. But for a few more flies, she could be home. When the women return at two, she expects them to jingle. At least the one she's heard does things for quarters. But Annie's the one who pays her in rolled up dollars, who waves at her from the window like someone's mom. There's nothing really worth telling those other sitters 
who worked tonight for good people in fancy houses, then scattered before the dads tried to drive them home. And this is JC and me in the summer of 64. Catholicism and puberty duped it out. The summer my body broke out of its corral and galloped Patterson streets in search of sugar through the new and luscious grasses of impure thought. The priest I confessed to dismissed me as overly scrupulous. I was thinking too much about thinking of dirty things and distracted because the word scrupulous started with screw I left with a head full of sin and two holy cards, which he passed me as if they were discards in holy strip poker, a game I imagined instructive and entertaining. The first was Saint Agatha, Sicily's virgin martyr. Her eyes rolled up to God as often mine were. She would not renounce him despite the terrible tortures he could, being God, have simply plucked her from. If it were me, I'd have just said, Jesus who? Then cantered right out of there with my virgin self and ducked behind the bleachers at Hinchliffe Stadium. The second holy card was Jesus himself, bathed in a golden light and softly smiling, halo tipped back and eyes beaming mercy and mirth. I hadn't noticed till then how handsome he was eyes like blue poppies, a nose I regarded with envy, wavy auburn hair with a center part. I pictured the halls of St. Ag's full of boys in caftans and me with my black hair tossing in the hot pink short shorts that got me suspended from school. Imagine, I thought, when he too was confused and changing, not quite a man yet, and almost, but not quite, God. Hear me calling his name, though he's already heading toward me, the August wind blowing his robe between his legs, the power to miracle lighting his holy face, a gingery fuzz on his lip, and an eager smile telling me I have powers too. At my nearness, his thoughts will cleave the Patterson Falls, send beer cans and tires jouncing down McBride, and cause the all the way hot dogs at Libby's lunch to vault like angels from their very secret sauce. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, um, hang on one second, chat. Um, let me see if I can do this right. Uh, okay. um, so that was marvelous. What we're gonna do right now is um, we're gonna take a little break so that um, we can tell you a little bit about the things that are happening at the writer's circle. Um, if I have four readers for the open mic right now. Um, if you do want to read, you can put your name in the chat. Um, just as a reminder, we are, um, we are, our open mic readers are limited to two poems. So please do adhere to that. We have the power of muting. So <laughs> that's a terrible way to cut you off. <laughs> Don't make us do that. All right. Um, so, uh, Judy, would you like to talk a little bit about what we are doing? Sure, absolutely. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly so you can see what's up at the Writer's Circle in the coming weeks and kind of in the coming months. Um, obviously, today we're so happy to have Kat and that was an extraordinary reading. Um, next week, um, at the same time, May 2nd, we, oh no, actually it starts at 10. We have a half day workshop in, titled From Pitch to Publication with freelance writer and editor, Lisa Levy. That will be another virtual event. And if you have works that you wanna get out into the world, this is the place to be next Sunday. 
Also coming up in June, we have the first of two wonderful events with longtime acquisitions editor at Penguin Random House and author Carol DeSanti. June 13th, she'll be presenting in Reinventing the Path to Publication. And then we're taking the summer break, but she returns to us the weekend of September 18th through 19th for Creative Recovery Masterclass. This will be a weekend of revisiting your muse and finding your own voice, especially those of us who've been struggling to write through the pandemic, which shockingly is not an uncommon story that we've heard. Um, take a, a look at that opportunity. It is a submission only workshop for a small group of writers and Carol is an extraordinary person to work with. She was my editor for my first novel when I published with Viking, so I cannot recommend her highly enough. You can see there's lots of other events coming up all the way through to the end of the year, including we hope and pray a return to our Autumn Writers Retreat, which takes place in Mendon, New Jersey in person. It's a wonderful, peaceful and enriching weekend, which we hope you will join us for. And then finally, kind of returning to the immediate next, um, the last program we have available on our current spring workshop is Where Do I Begin? with uh, April Darcy. It's a six week version of our workshop that starts on May 8th at 2.30 PM. So everything else we've got is already begun. Although if you wanna join in late, you're more than welcome, but do take a look at Where Do I Begin? Saturdays at 2.30 starting on May 8th. And I think that's it, right, Michelle? That, that is it, okay. So we're gonna start the um, open mic at this time. Um, and hang on, I'm just double checking the chat. Okay, so we're gonna start with David Williams. I'm gonna read two short poems. The light in my closet. I turned it on. I did not go blind. I did not go mad. There was no mirror, but I saw myself. I was not bad. I was not a freak. I was human. The light in my closet led me to open the door and step outside. The second one, the title is a direct quote, and it is, I'm gay. I leapt beyond the edge of the 100 foot drop into the river. My elbow locked arms spread wide, a perfect swan dive, hands trembling from fear of crashing into a foot of rocky water, overridden by hopes of landing smoothly in the deep pool. I straightened my body, plunging head first. Seated with you both in your den, where the family lolls about all day, relaxing, watching TV. Now, late evening, the TV off, and I have said to you those dreaded words. I hit the water, my fists and arms piercing the surface, hurtling deep into the pool, never touching the bottom the water ice cold, fed from an underground spring. Thank you. Thank you, David. Our next reader is going to be Evelyn Dahl. Hello, everyone. My first uh, poem is called My Wishes. I wish I could be a giant umbrella protecting you during rains and storms, a shield to defend you in the battles you face, a light to accompany you in darkness, a vital presence while you surmount hills, a comfort as you navigate decisions, at your side, chatting 
and reminiscing about days gone by and or rowing your boat to the other shore with love. And this is the other one. How could we comprehend? If we had not shed tears or walked in sorrow, would we feel for another lost in dark forest of pain, sorrow, despair? Willingness to help someone is formed by love, heartfelt knowing the fullness of our experience opens horizons, grants understanding. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lynn. All right, our next reader um, will be Heather Newman. And just in case anyone is keeping track, we uh, now have six readers. So Heather, you are right in the middle. Thanks. Um, I just want to say I loved hearing Catherine Doty's reading. Um, it's a perfect ex example to me of um, great detail makes great poetry. Um, I really had a glimpse of the Patterson childhood and um, you really brought me there. So thank you for the reading. Um, I'm going to read two poems. The first one is from a new anthology edited by James Cruz uh, called How to Love the World. The poem is called Missing Key. The doors are locked and I'm searching for a way in. I circle my house intent on finding a crack in a system, a faulty wind, sun will dip behind the mountain, temperatures will fall, and I may still be stuck outside cursing. There are friends, there are neighbors, or I could resolve nothing, sit on the cool grass and wait. On my iPhone, I view my furious attempts to break in, recorded on the outdoor cameras. There are family members who hold a key, but rescues have never worked for me in the past. I consider places for lost or hidden keys. They say gratitude is a key, solitude is a mountain. There are pines, cedars, and hemlocks, a range against the mango magenta horizon, a red-tailed hawk circling its prey. And the next one is called The Tryst. This is a tryst poem. It does not pretend to be a love poem. It's a meeting of the body in spite of the mind. It is trans knows its end from the beginning, justifies itself when misunderstood. It can be reserved like a Civil War love letter or fall to cliche like his You're Dangerous, followed by her no, you are. A tryst poem plays rhyme games like baby do the twist, resist my kiss. Oh, please persist, get my gist. It skips blank space. Impetuous and explosive, it tends to self-publish. And if it happens to lounge carelessly in a French bistro on a busy corner in Manhattan, you can bet the joie de vie of your tete-a-tete will turn quel dommage, much like the end of a French noir film. Thanks. All right, that was that was absolutely lovely, Heather. All right, next will be uh, Barry Ecker. Barry? Hi, everybody. It's nice to see you all again. Thank you, Kat. Can you guys hear me? Yes? OK. The first poem is called The Enophile. He brought his own bottle of red from his special collection, glad to pay the corking fee. I declined and he seemed put off, but poured a glass for his wife and for himself. I was content with a generic Pinot Grigio, but at his urging, I took a sip, but told him it was too dry. He grimaced and his wife sent me a warning look as she told him not to drink the whole bottle by himself. <laughs> he swished observing closely, then closed his eyes and brought the wine glass to his nose. 
to breathe in earthy vineyards from the south of France. He drank and poured again. Dinner was served and we chatted about old times. As he drank and she sipped, moving her glass further away from his reach. He began to expand and she to contract before my fairly sober gaze. Melted mozzarella dribbled down his chin. His words lost their sharp edges and his laugh grew loud. Still he poured and drank. Her glass was full, untouched, her fingers wrapped around the stem. He nuzzled her hair, but she barked at him and waved the empty bottle in his face. When he turned for just a moment to get the check, she quickly poured her wine into what was left in her coffee cup and left to use the ladies room. After paying the bill, he noticed that she hadn't finished her coffee, so he did and sprayed it all over the white tablecloth and his cream colored cable knit sweater. Their coffee's terrible, he choked. I laughed out loud and he asked me what I was laughing at. And the second one is Brighton Beach circa 1990. Herbie, so what do you think of this growing old crap? I don't know, Solly. The world, it goes too fast for me. As soon as I get the hang of a VCR, they're using DVDs. The kids, they speak in words I don't understand, and always with the cell phone stuck to their ears. Do you have a cell phone, Solly? I had three, but they all drowned. Drowned? Go on. What do you mean drowned? The first one my daughter gave me for emergencies only and I kept it in my shirt pocket and forgot about it. One day I was in Herb's Delicatessen having a corned beef sandwich and I went to the men's room to pee out of the pocket. It flew like a bird and straight into the toilet. And no way was I gonna stick my hand into the toilet at the back of Herb's Delicatessen. So what happened to the second one? I went to the beach and took a swim and it's floating someplace in Brighton Beach. And so, so my daughter bought for me one last phone and my great-grandson threw it in the fishbowl. <laughs> fishbowl? Why? He said he wanted to speak to the fish. You're better off without. We've lived for 85 years without the damn things. We can do a few years more. So how's your son, Herbie? He's coming along. It's been a year since his wife, whose name I won't say, decided to quit a good teaching job. Can you imagine? Gave up the pension, the benefits, to find herself with her yoga instructor. Oh, Herbie. This finding yourself. How is it we always knew where we were and never had to be found? I don't know, Solly. Tell me, do you believe in God? Of course, don't you? I'm not sure anymore. I go to shul every week, but it's like Elvis has left the building. I don't think anyone's there anymore. If God were there, why does he let such terrible things happen? So no, I don't believe in God, Solly. So how's the wife, Herbie? She's fine, thank God. That's it. Okay, thank you, Barry. Yeah. All right, next is Christina Zagachi. I hope I said that your last name right, and apologies if I haven't. Hi. Uh, lovely listening to all the poems. Um, my first poem is called Longing. Um, just, uh, um, it's, it's, it's translated from a diary of poems my dad wrote, so I translated it into English. Uh, in the e it's called Longing. In the evening from afar, somewhere flows my mother's melodious words like a nightingale. In the strings of my soul, hitting a chord, awakening a longing, then disappears. The melodies pass subside into the distance. Longing that burns and tugs at my thoughts endless as space, gigantic as the sea, violent like a storm, blinding like daybreak, like a burning hell, my soul is lost. And this one's a little bit longer. Um, it's called Laughter Through Tears, Yalta. Give me a pen, let my thoughts be poured onto white paper. Let me tell you why in these sad times I am laughing. Why am I laughing when I should be crying? Who looks and sees clearly that all the agreements and pacts are being ridiculed instead of virtue and honesty, instead of honesty and faith, 
lies and betrayal, attired in justice, asking for holy offerings, crime, deception, fraud, path to the target. Falsehood diplomacy is a cunning craft, shameless cynicism for many is their only life lesson. Bogus vows, genocide, dressed like prophets, humanity drowsily deceived, smoking, incense, burning. Wake up, people, wake, wipe your eyes. Start the renewal process before they put chains on your hands, before they put a chain on your neck. And now the biggest laugh it awakens in me. So-called leaders of humanity as they squeeze the paws of tyrants in the shadows of freedom rules. Judas squeezed the right hand of the executioner, smoking cigars over wine the na that nation called world's inspiration should disappear for the greater good. Over the grave again you stand today, Poland, by the open coffin obligingly in agreement for the blood of our son's children. Smiling they pay you, Yalta. All right, um, amazing. All right, next is Ann Sherman, and then we'll, we'll have Mary Franklin um, to, to conclude. So, Ann. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, Kat, I just wanted to say also, um, I love the detail in your poems and did when I first read Wonderama. And even though I didn't grow up in Patterson, I grew up in a very different place. There is something about the details that evokes a certain time period in a childhood. And it, it's just wonderful, I think. So um, I'm really moved by your poems. So, um, okay. So my first poem is called Off to Eden. Um, I notice the bravado that you wear now, like your father's old green cotton coat he lately gave you as you stride toward the train. Although you love the flowers that I taught you to embroider on the sleeves, the coat is thin and offers scant protection from the wind and snow and rain. In the car before you left, I was nearly speechless as the distance opened up between us due to all I was not able to explain. I'd wish to weave you something close knit, but in the end, the fabric was shot through with tattered ribbons made of anger, fear, and pain. The woof and warp was poorly crafted long before you came along by two young people so ill-suited they weren't any kind of match for the inevitable strain. I could not see as I was living through that time how it would one day all unravel due to feelings that I chose to hide and others that I chose to feign. My aim was always to protect you, but I got tangled up and though I failed, if I'd succeeded despite the heavy cost to me, I'd gladly do it all again. I'm so elated you can walk away with your new name to a new life full of joy and promise and that despite it all, I'm the one who must remain. Go be happy, don't look backward, make a crazy quilt adventure. Knowing you and your rainbow colors, I'm certain that the pattern won't be plain. But if it gets cold and that green coat fails you, don't forget these arms that held you skin to skin and not so long ago. I still remember you, my baby Jane. And then the second one I'm gonna read is called Adult Swim. Seated, no, Carefully posed on a towel by the pool, red polka dotted Mayo hugging curves both wanted and unwanted, painfully self aware and the center of the universe, the incarnation of possibility, all eyes on her. Behind her, at an acceptable distance on a plastic lounge chair, the Times crossword puzzle resting on a paunch, unwanted but difficult to shed, painfully aware of her and no longer being the center of her attention, the forgotten hero of yesterday's fallen ice creams, eyes on all eyes on her. Wonderful, wow. All right, and our final reader will be Mary Franklin. Mary, you need to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? 
I, yeah, I don't hear can, you now. Yeah, Hello? We, we can hear you. Okay. We hear you. Okay. Called Cinderella. My bed sheets are bleached kitchen white, edges tightened under mattress, hard against the crisscross metal at window. I look beyond the flowers lined singly on my wall to the pool of paper escape my mother. I watch carefully, pressing my fingernails to sill, waiting for another giggle. I think I've dreamed her. My mother never laughs, only cries long in bathrooms. But the summer wind cools the earth. My skates found delicately loosened by father to fit my mother. He tightens them on Cinderella feet, my key in pocket, they move in clumsy dance and dip glide ballet down the gravel brook till they reach my window. Last time my mother ends up in tall grass, her legs open as she calls to her prince. Father gently plants himself on top, covering her small thinness. Near lilac, honeysuckle, my mother, father laugh, conspire like naughty children. It is no longer dusk and I retreat to dream and soften the edges of my bed sheets. Okay. So this is the wrong platform. I miss the train. The stench filters up from the platform, smells of death, old news, tired. I break my commandment of keeping my wall in place, stare sideways at a bench filled with ragged, maybe not a bath in 10 or 20 days. People who carry life in plastic bags. Three people, I, a voyeur, grabbing pieces of conversation. I was angry, lost jobs. I drank too much, no more. I'm just trying to make it. The woman next to him puts a rag filled hand on his knee, comfort for a child. Gently places her head on his dirty shoulder. She sleeps. Man, I know just what you're going through. Can't afford my medicine trying to be okay. The thin man almost disappearing. It's my birthday today. I'm 60. He looks 80. The man with sleeping beauty on his shoulder puts his arm around the birthday boy on the other side. Happy birthday. Time stops. I'm on the down, downtown platform going uptown. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And thank you to everybody. So I know no one can hear our applause, but a round of applause, please, for um, all of the colleagues and, of course, especially Kat. So wonderful. And again, um, Judy and I hope that you will come back to the writer's circle for, um, you know, more, more readings, more poetry, um, and um, just to, um, you know, get some inspiration and creativity going, all right? So thanks, everyone, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Bye now. Thank you.